Uh, let me now turn to uh, introduce my friend and longtime colleague, Jackie Cavasso, who has served since 1984 as the executive director of the Western States Legal Foundation. Also, she served as the North American coordinator of Mayors for Peace, co-convener of United for Peace and Justice National Coalition, and she is the founding mother of the International Abolition 2000 Network. She has been an advocate and organizer for nuclear disarmament, for nonviolence, and environmental protection for 40 years. Her work encompasses local grassroots activism, including nonviolent direct action, advocacy, organizing, and networking at the national and international levels. Uh, Jackie's research and analysis have been published in numerous articles and books. Uh, she's no slouch as an organizer. As part of her work with Mayors for Peace last month, she led the U.S. Conference of Mayors to adopt a resolution calling for urgent action to avoid nuclear war, resolve U the Ukraine conflict, lower tensions with China, and redirect military spending to meet human needs. Jackie, the floor is yours. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you very much, uh, Joseph and Kevin, for inviting me. It's really um, an honor to be part of this distinguished panel. So I'll just fill in a few, a few points about deterrence. The Latin root of the word deterrence means to frighten away, fill with fear. In other words, to threaten. Deterrence undergirds entire military industrial establishments and the national security states and elites they serve. It is an elastic ideology which has outlived its Cold War origins and is twisted and turned by nuclear armed states to justify the perpetual possession and threatened use, including first use of nuclear weapons. In the US, national security policy has been remarkably consistent in the post-World War II and post-Cold War eras. Nuclear deterrence, the threatened use of nuclear weapons, has been reaffirmed as the cornerstone of US national security by every president, Republican or Democrat, since 1945, when President Harry Truman, a Democrat, oversaw the atomic bombings of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Unfortunately, Russia and other would-be superpowers have increasingly fashioned their own national security policies on the US model. As described in a 2008 US Department of Defense report, nuclear deterrence is achieved by credibly threatening a potential adversary with the use of nuclear weapons so as to prevent that adversary from taking actions against the United States, its allies, or its vital interests. This is accomplished primarily by maintaining sufficient and effective nuclear capabilities to pose unacceptable costs and risks upon the adversary should it so act. Now, listen to this. Though our consistent goal has been to avoid actual weapons use, the nuclear deterrent is used every day by assuring friends and allies, dissuading opponents from seeking peer capabilities to the United States, deterring attacks on the United States and its allies from potential adversaries, and providing the potential to defeat adversaries if deterrence fails. In a 2021 article titled Forging 21st Century Strategic Deterrence, U.S. Navy Admiral Charles Richard, then Chief of U.S. Strategic Command, wrote, We must acknowledge the foundational nature of our nation's strategic nuclear forces as they create the maneuver space for us to project conventional military power strategically. So you see, you can't just pluck nuclear weapons out of the equation. They play an integral role with conventional weapons. With Russian and Israeli leadership's veiled and not so veiled nuclear threats, Russia and Israel have both been using their nuclear deterrence in this way so far, but it's undeniable that the longer these wars go on, the greater the threats of wider regional conflict and the potential for nuclear escalation become. The Biden administration's October 2022 nuclear post review doubled down on the centrality of nuclear deterrence in U.S. national security policy, declaring, quote, for the foreseeable future, nuclear weapons will continue to provide unique deterrence effects that no other element of U.S. military power can replace. To ensure that these unique deterrence effects are available for the indefinite future, the U.S. is planning to spend $2 trillion over the next 30 years to maintain and modernize its nuclear triad, building new ballistic missile submarines, new silo-based intercontinental ballistic missiles, a new nuclear cruise missile, a modified gravity bomb, a new stealthy long-range strike bomber, 
and accompanying warheads for each delivery system with modified or new plutonium pits. Pits are the cores of hydrogen bombs. To give some perspective on the scale of this endeavor, at an April 2024 symposium, Na National Nuclear Security Administrator, that's NNSA, Jill Ruby stated, the reestablishment of pit production capabilities is the largest and most complex infrastructure undertaking at the National Nuclear Security Agency since shortly after the Manhattan Project. And NNSA delivered over 200 modernized weapons to the Department of Defense this past year, the most since the end of the Cold War. If, God forbid, Trump becomes the next U.S. president, we can expect an even more aggressive nuclear deterrent stance. This is spelled out in Project 2025, a 900-page report by a coalition, coalition of over 100 far-right groups led by the Heritage Foundation, widely seen as a playbook for a second Trump administration. And NATO is a nuclear alliance. As stated on its website, NATO continues to affirm the importance of nuclear deterrence in light of evolving challenges. The 2022 strategic concept states that NATO's deterrence and defense posture is based on an appropriate mix of nuclear conventional and missile defense capabilities complemented by space and cyber capabilities. Again, I want to underscore the integral nature, the, the uh, integration of nuclear weapons into these other weapons systems. So watch for reaffirmation of the centrality of nuclear deterrence in statements coming out of this week's NATO 75th anniversary summit in Washington, D.C. Over half the world's population lives in countries whose national security postures explicitly depend on nuclear weapons and the doctrine of nuclear deterrence. In my view, nuclear deterrence is the Gordian knot blocking the path to nuclear disarmament. It's daunting to acknowledge the entrenched power of the forces we're up against, and it's humbling to offer suggestions about what we can do to overcome them. I don't think we can succeed as a single issue movement. I don't think we can rely on celebrities or funders. I think we need to imagine new ways to make common cause with other constituencies based on shared values and vision. And I think we need to build a movement from the bottom up in order to create the political power that will allow for change at the top. I will briefly introduce three initiatives which I believe have the potential to reach out broadly and to, build, to help build this kind of a movement. And I'll be happy to elaborate during Q&A. Mayor Surpice, founded in 1982 by the mayors of Hiroshima and Nagasaki, is working for a world without nuclear weapons, safe and resilient cities, and a culture of peace. I have served as an executive advisor and North American coordinator for Mayors to Peace since 2007. It was my privilege and pleasure to work with Mayor Akiba until he left office in 2011. During Mayor Akiba's tenure and the 2020 vision campaign he led, membership increased by tenfold to over 5,000 cities in 151 countries and territories. As of July 1st, 2024, membership has reached 8,403 cities in 166 countries and territories. Our next membership goal is to reach 10,000 member cities as quickly as possible. But we also want to deepen the engagement of current members. Second, the Back from the Brink campaign is a US-based grassroots coalition of individuals, organizations, and elected officials working together toward a world free of nuclear weapons and a safer, more just future. Back from the Brink calls on the United States to lead a global effort to prevent nuclear war by actively pursuing a verifiable agreement among nuclear armed states to eliminate their nuclear arsenals, renouncing the option of using nuclear weapons first, ending the sole authority, unchecked authority of any US president to launch a nuclear attack, taking US nuclear weapons off hair trigger, trigger alert, and canceling the plan to replace the entire US nuclear arsenal with enhanced weapons. HRES 77 in the U.S. House of Representatives calls on the U.S. to adopt Back from the Brink's comprehensive policies prescriptions for reducing nuclear risks and preventing nuclear war, and to embrace the goals and provisions of the Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons. There are currently 44 co-sponsors. Finally, the Poor People's Campaign, a national call for moral revival, is picking up the unfinished work of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., addressing the interlocking injustices of systemic poverty, systemic racism, environmental devastation, militarism in the war economy, and the distorted moral narrative that blames poor people for their own poverty, and weaving them together into one moral fusion campaign, centering the voices of those most directly impacted. When asked about the role of inspiration and intuition in his discoveries, 
Albert Einstein reportedly said, I am enough of the artist to draw freely upon my imagination. Imagination is more important than knowledge. Knowledge is limited. Imagination encircles the world. Archbishop John Wester of Albuquerque, New Mexico recently wrote, just as imagination enabled Einstein to see the beyond the limits of scientific knowledge, moral imagination can span the seemingly unbridgeable, unbridgeable chasm between the world as it is and the world we so desperately need. By opening our hearts to the power of love and releasing our minds from the chains of fear, it can make a world without nuclear weapons a reality. To achieve the elimination of nuclear weapons in a global society that is more fair, peaceful, and ecologically sustainable, we will need to move from the irrational fear-based ideology of deterrence to the rational fear of an eventual nuclear weapons use, whether by accident, miscalculation, or design. We will also need to stimulate our rational hope that security can be redefined in humanitarian and ecologically sustainable terms that will lead to the elimination of nuclear weapons and dramatic demilitarization, freeing up tremendous resources desperately needed to address universal human needs and protect the environment. In this time of multiple global crises, our work for the elimination of nuclear weapons must take place in a much broader framework taking into account the interface between nuclear and conventional weapons and militarism in general, the humanitarian and long-term environmental consequences of nuclear war, and the fundamental incompatibility of nuclear weapons with democracy, the rule of law, and human well-being. And my final comment will be visual. Can you see that? So, yep. This is us, okay? We need to disregard these guys and tell our own truths. Thank you.